Hey friends, good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome to the scripture habit. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a place where I hope you find encouragement and accountability, support to develop the habit of getting into scripture every day. Uh, God's word, he uses it to transform us with the Holy Spirit. It's like this awesome thing that happens, right? Uh, and so we want to encourage you to get into God's word regularly, right? To make the time. So we show up and say, hey, we'll meet you. We'll read through scripture together. We'll talk about it and ask the Lord to work in our heart through his word. My name is Rebecca, by the way. I'm a pastor and I get to be a host here at the scripture habit. I say welcome and good morning. Like Darlene, I see you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? And Gloria, good morning, guys. All right, we're gonna wait just a second just to make sure uh, signal and everything is right and give our friends a chance to start to join in. And then we are going to pray. And we're gonna be in the beginning of chapter four of 1 John today. We're only gonna look at verses one through six. There's a lot of good stuff in there, all right? Georgia, good morning. All right. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, good morning, Lord. We set our attention on you. Thank you for this time, Lord. Wherever we are, whatever might be going on around us, thank you that the time that we spend with you and your word is sacred. It's powerful. It's precious. And we just thank you for this opportunity. Speak to us through your word. Uh, build us up in faith, we ask. In your name, amen. Amen. All right. Hi, Rita. Good morning. Thank you very much, Darlene. Thank you for that. All right, we're going to read verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4 of 1 John. Got it? Let's do it. Here we go. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Okay. This passage, this section. Good morning, Bonnie. John is writing to this early church specifically about false teachers, false teachers. And actually, I'm like, God, this is so cool because uh, we ha have kind of an overlap from what, what I was teaching on this past Sunday. Uh, false teaching, all right? First, let's kind of break out what exactly is false teaching, all right? This, this spirit of truth versus the spirit of error. It says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. What is he talking about here? Um, first thing for us to recognize Every spirit which presents itself as a prophet. A prophet is basically anyone who claims to speak on behalf of God. Right? Anyone who claims to speak on behalf of God. Um, the gift of prophecy is not fortune telling. Although some people who have the gift of prophecy can speak into the future. No. Um, the gift of prophecy. Sorry, there you go. The gift of prophecy is... Just anyone who is speaking to pronounce a word that they say they've received from the Lord. Scripture tells us that we're supposed to test these. Now, but they say the word spirit, right? I think it's really interesting. So I just wanted to finish this quote here. This is from uh, the JFB or the CCEWB. Okay, every spirit presents itself in the person of a prophet. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error speak by men's spirits as their organs, which basically is saying uh, the message comes from a human, right? This 
human um, mouthpiece, right? But it says that there's a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. And we need to know the difference, right? Scripture says, if you look at the top there, test the spirits to see if they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This was very prevalent for the early church back then where people, whether they intended to or not, um, would speak claiming authority from God like they knew it and like they had a word from the Lord, uh, but they were misguiding people. And that is just as much of a concern for us today as it was the early church back then. All right. Okay. This is this is one of my favorite thing, favorite things to talk about. Not really, but when it comes to this idea of false prophet, it says test the spirits to see if they're from God. Matthew teaches in the Sermon on the Mount in I'm sorry, Matthew. Jesus teaches in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. He teaches us. He says, you will know them by their fruit. And when Jesus was teaching that, he was specifically talking about false teachers. Did you know that? Good morning, Stephanie. Jesus was specifically speaking to his followers speaking to his disciples and he's saying you need to watch out for false teachers he, he actually said they come like in sheep's clothing when really they're ra ravaging wolves they look the part of a follower of jesus a sheep and the shepherd right they look the part but they're not they'll actually do a lot of damage they can actually cause trauma and even the image of ravaging were wolves i like that image because it's that they're, some, they're hungry for something. They want to feed. They want something to be satisfied in them. And it's not God because they're willing to hurt people to get it. And, and when I talk about, well, what's hungry in them that would feed them? Mm, could be ego. Could be power. Could be this need for uh, status or praise or accolade or influence, right? Uh, it's <clears throat> false teachers don't go like, I'm going to be a false teacher so I can purposely hurt people and divide the church. No, it's that they have this thing in them and it leads them to be susceptible to the wrong influences and to speak the, the wrong thing, not truth. Yeah? Now, uh, let me see if I put it on here. Uh, okay, there's this phrase. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Don't judge lest you be judged, right? Jesus said that actually a couple of verses before in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, by the way, when he was speaking about that, uh, he was talking about uh, hypocrites. He was saying, don't judge lest you be judged. The measure by which you judge a person, that's how you're going to be measured. He was saying, don't, don't look at them and like complain about the speck in their eye when you have a plank in your eye, right? That was Jesus speaking. But he was talking about hypocrites, guys. There's this false idea that we're not supposed to judge. And I think that that is ridiculous because that's basically someone saying, you know, you're supposed to suspend logic. You're supposed to suspend discernment, right? No, no, we are, we are called to inspect and evaluate and discern everything. In fact, I think I put that, I'll show you a slide in a second. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, test everything and hold on to what is good. And let me just say, uh, the other phrase that comes through my mind, right, is you'll hear some church people, uh, when someone starts to question a teaching of a pastor, or if their fruit of their life is inconsistent, with being a follower of Christ, uh, someone will push back like, don't you, or uh, touch not my anointed, right? Have you ever heard that? The churchy thing. Touch not my anointed as if to say, oh, you can't criticize the pastor. You can't, you know, point out that he's teaching, he or she is teaching incorrectly. That is a complete misuse of that word too. That was Old Testament. That was relating to the period where they were killing the prophets of God who were proclaiming truth. But if you look at the model of Jesus, right? Jesus who came to speak truth, uh, he didn't get upset at anybody that questioned him or criticized him, did he? Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
We are called to test the spirit, which means to evaluate the messages from the people who claim that they are speaking on behalf of the Lord. You are supposed to use discernment. You're supposed to test, friend. You're supposed to test. And that includes uh, anyone that speaks on behalf, whether it's someone saying, I have a word from the Lord, I have a prophecy, uh, or if it's a pastor teaching what God is revealing in scripture. I expect you, that's what I said to my church, I expect you to evaluate the fruit, right? Before you've just taken a message and just assume it's from the Lord, you need to test it, yeah? There we go. First Thessalonians 5.21, I, I quoted that to you already. Test everything, but hold on to what is good, which implies, hey, if it's not good, if it's not consistent, you just cast it off and you keep moving, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Okay, so John is speaking to the early church here and he's saying, listen, don't believe everything, right? Many false prophets come out. You need to test to see if they're from God. And then he says in verse two, the beginning, this is how you know the spirit of God. I put this quote on the screen. It's a little bit longer. I know it's kind of wordy, but I want, I want you to understand this description. All right. John was speaking of people who claimed to be Christians, but who spoke as deadly opponents to Christianity. He was also referring to church services much more informal than our own. In early services with the early church, visitors could stand and claim to speak from the Spirit of God. Anyone could do it. John wanted to provide direction to distinguish between the true and the false. John directed his readers to test the words of those who claim to speak for God because the possibility of the presence of false prophets. I know that was really wordy, but does that give you a better picture of why John was uh, giving such instruction? We're going to see, actually, there's another, there's another side to this, which is understanding exactly uh, some of the tension that was happening in the early church then we're gonna see it let me move forward so this is how you know he says all right he says here this is how you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses jesus christ has come in the flesh is from god but every spirit that does not confess jesus is not from god i think people can uh, misunderstand what this verse is about all right <laughs> good morning again rita hi Hi, Melanie. Um, this is not the exclusive litmus test for discerning spirits, for, dis for discerning if someone is from God or not, whether or not they say Jesus is in the flesh. This is one that's specific to the heretical teaching that the early church was really having to combat. And that heretical teaching was questioning um, if Jesus was really man if he had really come in the flesh. Let me pull this up here. Um, a heretical teaching at that time was the belief that Jesus was God, but not really man, that he didn't come in the flesh. So John challenges the believers to reject any word from people that hold that view. Okay. Today, some groups deny that Jesus is really God. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Muslims. They might say, yeah, he was a man, he was a great man, but they might deny his divinity, right? For the early church, guys, they were so close to Jesus having lived in the ministry and you know the people that witnessed his life, like they were still living. They did not um, question the divinity of Jesus. They questioned if he was really man. So I think sometimes there's a shift here you know, we might say, like, of course he was a man, right? There's evidence of him living. That was the teaching that they were up against, all right? I want to go back to this quote. So Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Muslim, they actually deny that Jesus is really God, but way back in John's day, in, in this time, closest to the actual life and ministry of Jesus on this earth, people didn't have a hard time believing that Jesus was God. They had a hard time believing he was a real man. 
the false teaching said that Jesus was truly God, which is correct, um, but really a, a make-believe man. Those two ideas, Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man. I want you to know that those are essential and foundational for our faith. To perceive Jesus as anything less than, than God um, is to nullify the work that he did in the same way that thinking that Jesus wasn't fully man would nullify the work. Why? Because Jesus, um, he, he stood in our place, right? And he was the one that was able to be victorious over death. The only way that Jesus could be victorious over sin was to be God because only God was sinless, right? Only God had the power and the authority and the ability to overcome sin and death. A human on their own could not have done that. At the same time, to be fully man, but not fully God, means that Jesus wouldn't have had the power to do that either. So those two teachings really mattered. John points this out, right? And he says, the you know, anyone that doesn't say that Jesus came in the flesh, like they're not from God, you shouldn't listen, listen to them. Not exclusive. That was just one quick way for them to discern if they were going to be listening to a false teacher or not. This quote here, both the deity and the humanity of Jesus are essential to our salvation. Yeah. Okay. I included this quote from the Faith Life Study Bible because I think this gives a greater picture then for believers. How do you and I then discern the spirit uh, to know if it's from God or not beyond just if they proclaim Jesus? coming in the flesh or not. Because listen, there are, there are false teachings in the church today and around the church where, again, it's kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing because they'll present, they'll present like they're, like they're a Christian, like they're a follower of Christ, that they believe in the fullness of God's word, right? Um, but things that come in their mouth, out of their mouth aren't consistent. And so this, this quote from the Faith Life Study Bible, I want to show it to you. It says, believers derive their ability to test truth and falsehood from their anointing by God, their knowledge of the teachings of Jesus, and the work of the Holy Spirit in them. They can determine a spirit's origin by examining whether its teaching reflects the love of Christ. I love that. You and I, we're not called to suspend logic or reality as we navigate faith. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, it doesn't mean that faith will always make sense, that we know all the parts, no. But when you and I are, are walking through and we're studying and we're learning to know the heart of God, the person of Jesus, right? We're learning to know these things. That's for our benefit because the more time we spend with him, the easier it's going to be for you and for me to be like, wait a minute, mm, that doesn't line up with something that I know Jesus said. That right there doesn't line up. I love how that phrase at the end uh, talked about, you're going to see if they line up to the love of Christ because I, I see a lot of people that tout the name of Jesus, but there is no love in their message. It's only condemnation, right? I think of the uh, Westboro Baptist group. Is, wasn't that their name, right? Yeah, they tout Jesus. They proclaim his name. And yet, the things that come out of their mouth, the things that they write, awful things that they write on signs, are nothing but condemnation. And Jesus himself said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world, right? Yeah. Is this hitting anything so far? I'm really curious, guys. Give me some feedback what you're thinking. Let's go to the second half of this, okay? This says, you are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The question there is, what have they conquered? Who is the they, all right? Who is the they? False teachers. 
the, ch- the little children from God, you've conquered them. You've conquered the false teachers. I think it's so important because uh, uh, sometimes we can take this verse and try to just broadly apply it for anything, right? Um, it is true. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that part where it says, you know, you have conquered them. Sometimes I think we sub other things into that. Or we just try to say, yeah, you've conquered everything because greater is he that's in you that, you know, victory is yours for everything. And I just think that that's a misapplication. I do. Yeah. So I point this out. What have they conquered? John is specifically talking about false teaching. He's talking about these people that are trying to um, lead people to follow them and away from the gospel, all right? Quite simply, as his readers struggled with the presence of false teaching, John assured them that the victory ultimately belonged to them. And by victory, using that word conquering, this is the victory right here. We can experience victory in discerning truth. You and I, we can do it. You and I have the capacity to discern truth from false teaching. But there's an if there. How are we going to be able to do that? We have to test it, right? And we have to rely on he who is in us instead of relying on ourselves. Again, and this is where this is where logic, if not with the Holy Spirit, can lead someone astray. Because um, logic alone, without the Holy Spirit in it, I mean that's just it's only part of the picture. And remember, false teaching often, they use part of the picture and then they just stray it, right? So the key there still, greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. As you and I are trying to navigate truth and uh, discern, hey, before I just embrace whatever this teaching is or this word is that someone proclaims is from God, uh, I need to I need to discern. And how am I going to discern? The Holy Spirit is going to give me discernment. The Holy Spirit's going to give me wisdom. I'm going to be able to use logic to reflect on the teachings that I know of Jesus compared to what this person is saying. Yeah, we lean into those things and that's how we have victory in discerning truth. It can be done, right? Okay, verse 5. He says, they are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world and the world listens to them. Again, who are they talking about when they say they? They are from the world. The false teachers, right? This whole section is about false teaching. And he's saying, okay, the false teachers are from the world. They're of the world. The world listens to them. When people skew the message of God. Often there's some type of agenda to it, you know? Either, like I I think one of the things that I see is that sometimes people feel like they want to make the gospel more palatable, you know? They want to make it more, they want to help it go down easier for people, um, this idea of Jesus. Uh, the idea of sin, right? So they skew it in a way that the world will be more appealed to. Because it's the world. The world's speaking of the world at that point, right? At that point, when they skew the word of God, it's no longer the word of God. It's the word of the world. So it makes sense, right? If so, someone's speaking something and the world's just like, woohoo evaluate that teaching. If you look at the the words of Jesus, there was so much hope, there was so much comfort because he spoke to people that the world had written off and said, God sees you, God died for you, right? Your sins are forgiven. 
go and sin no more, right? These messages, Jesus' harshest words were always to the religious, the self-righteous people who looked good in their own eyes, right? They liked their own logic and they missed the heart of God. They became of the world, their own agenda, their own ideas, they're following the flesh, it's the world. Yeah. All right, I wrote here, false teachers will be more appealing to the world. Their claims will sound more in line with worldly perspectives. But John said in verse 6, he said, they're of the world, but verse 6, we are from God. And anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. He gives this contrast. Okay, they're of the world. We're of God. The world listens to them. Their message is more appealing to the world. Uh, the world doesn't listen to us uh, necessarily. The message that we speak um, is not one that fits with the world's ideas. And world ideas could be things like um, just be a good person. World ideas could be things like you need to do all these things right? World's perspective could be, hey, you know, Jesus coming to die for people. Maybe, you know, there's some gray area there. Worldly perspective. Why? Because the world um, doesn't like to hear the truth of the gospel. Either they don't want to be called out on sin. They don't want to be told that their good efforts are not enough. They don't want to be told that um, faith in God is not about checking off boxes. Um, they don't want to be told that Jesus is the, the way to heaven. They don't want to be told that um, belief in Jesus establishes someone's relationship with God. They don't want to hear those things, right? Yeah. Um, but what I appreciate, what John says here when he talks about the messages, he's like, okay, well, the world likes the message of the world. It's appealing to them. They kind of like connect on it. But for people of God, those who are from God, the message that they speak will resonate with other believers. It'll connect with our heart. And the same way that the world's message like drew them together, the people of God were drawn together by the truth of the message, Right? Just as the, world's wor the words of the world's person were pleasing and received by others from the world, the words of a believer are pleasing and affirming to those who are believers. We're united through the Spirit of God, right? And he points out here, the end of that phrase, this is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. I pray that we like just recognize that reality. Um, there is always a battle between a word of truth or a word that has deception in it. And listen, if it has deception, it's not truth, right? I think sometimes like we'll, we'll take bits and pieces of something, you know, I don't want to throw the whole thing out. So, or I've seen, mm, guys, I have seen, we're talking about false prophets, I've seen people whose lives are completely inconsistent with the heart of God, and yet their followers will turn the other way and say, oh, well, you know, well, not, every, not everyone's perfect, and we're not, but, you know, blatant, blatant, blatant ego or uh, perversion or... Uh, condemnation or like these things that are absolutely inconsistent with God and they're like oh well mm. a leader that lacks character and integrity and yet believers stand behind them and follow them as if they're like this chosen one from God no no guys you will know them by their fruit right You'll know them by their fruit. I pray that we hear that. I really do. 
I feel like we turn off our logic sometimes, maybe because there's some other motivation in us that, you know, wants whatever story that other person is drumming up to be true. Or, or maybe they just like the energy. Uh, maybe there's a presence of following and they like being with it. But listen, you have to test the fruit. You're called to test the spirit, to test the message. And if it's not consistent, then you toss it. And that would be the sign to you not to follow that person. Got it? Some celebrities are false teachers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, here we go. Hi, Susan. Good morning. And Karen. Okay. This is my last slide for today. John is speaking, right? And John says, uh, they're from the world. We're from God, right? This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Listen, when we are from God, we carry the Holy Spirit within us. We have the ability to discern truth from deception if we listen and use spiritual discernment. This is what John was getting at with the people, with the early church, and it's just as important for you and me today. We judge, we're called to evaluate, to test, uh, to judge truth. We're not, we're not to condemn others. We're not to be hypocritical, right? But God gave us discernment. It's a spiritual gift and you should use it. Yeah? Let's pray. God, thank you so much that um, your word gives guidance. Your word speaks to challenges that we're facing in our world today. And your world gives us perspective. Your world gives us um, a foundation of truth to help us navigate. God, help us be aware of false teachers. Help us be aware of our, uh, our mandate that we're supposed to test everything, that we're supposed to you know, evaluate fruit. Help us, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's it for today. I know we went like two minutes longer. I think I'm sorry. Uh, do me a favor, hit the share button. Uh, invite someone into this study. We're starting this new chapter of uh, chapter four in First John. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up at verse seven. All right. Have a great day, guys. See you later.